Hello, everyone. And today we're joined by Joe Power, who's a restorative practices officer for Limerick as part of the restorative practice project. And he's going to answer some questions or dispel some myths around ORP and what it is, the benefits, and you know, should you look at doing it or even investigate it, etc. So whether you're watching this all in one go or you're watching it piecemeal, a little bit, piece by piece, it's up to yourselves. But hopefully some of these questions will enlighten you and give you some information that will help you uh, going forward. So uh, first of all, uh, welcome, Joe. Thank you. Hi, hi Joe. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So the first thing is you've been working and training in the area of restorative practice now for about three years. Um, has it, what's the biggest difference it's made in your own life? So, yeah, so I've been in, in, in the job for three years. I probably first came across it in my old job then a couple of years before that. But uh, how, how would I sum it up? I think it might sound a, a little bit corny, but I, I think I'm just you know, a, a better person. I think my, my relationships are better. Um, I have a better understanding of, of relationships, of, of conflict. Uh, and that's probably a lot of people's biggest fear. Uh, you know, what happens when things go wrong? So, I mean, I think most of us you know, like to think of ourselves as, as good people and, and have certain values. Uh, and for me, having the tools of a start of practice, again, might sound corny, but it allows me to kind of be my best self, live my values. Doesn't mean I, I, I don't make mistakes, of course I do. But, you know, I just have better relationships with my family. Uh, with colleagues I, I have some idea of what to do with like when things are going wrong and yes but look ultimately I tend to have less stress in my life than what I, what I might have had not that I had massive stress but I, I have less stress and I sleep better so it's just it's just been a huge benefit to my own life and um, personal professional um, yeah in every every aspect how do you see advantages for teachers uh, learning about restorative practice and bringing it into their classrooms yeah I, I, Again, I suppose a little bit like what, what I said about the benefit for myself, um, I, I would see this as a big benefit for, for any teachers. And, and I've heard many teachers express this already. Um, like teachers, obviously, you know, generally it's not the teaching aspect that, that tends to cause problems. And, you know, what, what I hear a lot is it's about this kid or this colleague or, you know, certain classes, you know, and, and it's, it tends to be that aspect of it that, that frustrates teachers. Um, so again, having a practice, and it's not, restorative practice isn't the only show in town. There are many other good, good programs, if you like. But having something like restorative practice where you can have an understanding of the emotions, the, what's happening for yourself and for, for the, the, the other people. And then, you know, some tools, you know, some, some practical tools that, that you can make, you can implement. So those small changes in, in your own approach, your own teaching, um, they tend to just have better outcomes. So, so again, back to relationships, better relationships with, 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 with the kids, with your colleagues, uh, and, and ultimately then less stress. Um, and then, you know, you can actually get back then to doing what, what you want to do, with, which is teach. Um, so I, I, I see many benefits and I hear many benefits for, from, from teachers uh, all the time. What's the biggest misconception that you find people have about restorative practice? Um, I suppose the Biggest one is, is oh, this is, this, I don't have time, you know, I think, and I can understand that, you know, um, when you first hear about it, you know, you're going to hear about language, questions, circles, shame, all these things. And, you know, at the start, you know, th there is a sense, of, possibly a sense of anxiety. Can, will I, can I learn this? Is it going to help? Is it going to be worth the effort? So th that this aspect of, of time, I think, um, is a big mis. Well, I mean, it's, it's valid, if you like, at the same time. But in, in my experience, and, and again, in, in the experience of, of, of teachers that, that, that I've worked with and, and other teachers, um, that if, if you put in the time up front, you know, if you do a little bit of work, a little bit of reflection, you know, uh, whatever it is up front, you will gain the time back in spades. Because, you know, as it is, again, a lot of teachers are probably spending a lot of time maybe dealing with challenging behavior. Um, so why not, if you like, front load that and then save time. And, and ultimately, you know, when I talk about using restorative practice, I mean, it can be the smallest, it can be one second change. Uh, it can be just taking a breath. So it can be very, when you actually get into it, it, it takes very little time, you know, just to get that point across. So rather than thinking oh, this is gonna take a long time, it's a couple of seconds in, in how you phrase something, or if you're doing a circle, it's a minute, 90 seconds. A, a quick circle like that can give you huge benefits. So that, that mis misconception, uh, and I suppose one other one then 
it's too soft. You know, you, you just, they just have to say sorry. Um, and if, if you're not in it, you know, if you're looking from the outside, okay, the, the, oh, this kid just said sorry to that kid. And, and that might look soft, but if you're in it, if you're the kid who's answering the questions, you know, what did you do? What were you thinking? What are you thinking now? What could you have done differently? Who was affected? What needs to happen next? If you're answering those questions, that is not easy. You know, people would nearly prefer to get a little slap on the wrist or whatever it is than answer those questions. So that, that idea that it's, it's too easy, it's too soft, um, that, that, that takes a bit of time to dispel, if you like. Yeah, so like the, the, uh, the slap on the wrist is like the punishment's done now, I'm off the hook, I can th- think about it again. Whereas if you're forced to confront your actions, Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. And, and then I suppose the, yeah, maybe if I don't know, a third misconception, you know, because because we tend to focus on the wrongdoer, if you like the person who's stepped out of line. But if you think about it, there's someone who who, who they've whose toes they have stepped on. Right. So, I mean, I don't, don't want to use the word victim, but if someone has been has been hurt, has been harmed and, you know, we don't tend to include them an awful lot in the process, in the outcome, get their opinions. What do they want? So this, uh, you know, so restart, when you're being restorative, you are as much or more focused on the person who has been harmed and not just the, you know, the, the wrongdoer. And as well as that, you're focused on, on the needs of both people because there's, there's a story, there's a background um, to all of it. And, and the person who might have, if you like, caused the harm, you know, they, there might be unmet, unmet needs there as well. Um, they might they might not have known how to ask for whatever it is they're asked. They might not have known how to take a turn. There might be a, a, a skill deficit. So by being restorative, you kind of you know you're getting the story. You're finding out okay, well I need to work on this kid. Well, just to use that example, um, maybe maybe tomorrow. Um, but for right now, you know I need to help if you like both sides and make sure you know that that both sides are happy. So it is it's, it's a different way of looking at things, but it, it takes everyone into account and. You're just getting hopefully a good, respectful, fair outcome for, for everyone. So there's, yeah, there, there are misconceptions um, which are important to, 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 to I suppose, address uh, at, at the beginning. So I suppose like the, the mindset changes one from firefighting and putting out fires all the time to fire prevention because you put a lot of effort yeah, at yeah. the start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 very well pushed because restorative practice has, if you like, been, been born out of restorative justice which is the, the criminal justice sphere, you know, offenders and victims, if you like, um, and, and facilitating dialogue where, where possible. And those ideas, if you like, have come into the, the school system. Um, but it's much more than that. Like if you're just, if you're like firefighting or, or dealing with things, you know, if you use the river analogy, you know, you're dealing with pollution or whatever it is, you know, there's something that's causing that, if you like, further upstream. And, and why not investigate that? Why not build the relationships? Why not build the skills, build the emotional vocabulary, emotional intelligence, and, and you know, put the effort in there uh, rather than putting all the effort in when, when things go wrong. Because uh, if you're just firefighting, that's a whole heap of stress. That's a whole heap of pressure. Um, that, that causes burnout and, and, you know, staff leaving, whatever it is. So, you know, it is work, um, but I prefer to be work putting the work in upstream, if you like, and, and being proactive uh, than just reactive. I've seen the start of questions and I've heard you talk about them and um, they seem to give a lot of control to the student um, as regards to what needs to happen. So how does this sit with the idea of the teacher as being the responsible adult and being, and they being in control of the class? Yeah. Um, I suppose, you know, as, as, a, as a teacher, I'm a parent of three kids myself, you know, we're, we're probably socialized or conditioned to kind of, you know, I'm the adult. I have to have the answers, you know, and that's a lot of pressure, you know. I mean, if you're a parent or a teacher uh, or whoever it is, and, and you're coming across a situation, you know, to try and almost instantly ascertain what's happened, who's wrong, who's right, what needs to happen, you know, that's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, you've got to try to be maybe judge and jury at the same time. You, you can't. So why not, if you like, ask the, the, the young people, the, the kids, if you like, um, and, and let them give them a go to, to answer the, the question. So get them to answer what's happened. Um, but they'll, they'll tell you uh, who's affected and, and what do you think needs to happen. So if you even just start with those questions, you know, what happened, who's been affected and what needs to happen. Um, more often than not, they'll come up with, with the answers, some good answers themselves. 
uh, and that's less pressure for you. You know, you don't have to, to know everything, be everything. Um, there's a, a quick story with my own two, two boys, and it's a few years ago, because people think you, know, you can't ask this, these questions to, to, to young kids as well. Um, so my two boys, they were eight and six at the time in, in the car going, going to cool camp as it was. And the eight-year-olds had um, the pencil belonging to, to the younger, his younger brother. And, you know, so the younger brother then grabs the pencil back, if you like, you know, it's, it's his pencil. And, and the eight-year-old then is kind of crying and daddy, 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 um, you know, and, and I'm just there then, you know, I suppose looking at the situation and I'm like, okay, Sean, say sorry to Michael, um, which is what we tend to do. We jump in with the, the, the answers, you know, just say sorry to Michael and Michael, you know, he's not having it, you know, college is not accepted. So, so by, by involving them in, in, in the conversation and so something like this, I just asked Sean, you know, uh, what, what were you thinking? And he's like, I don't know. You know, and again, at which point, you know, if you're a, a, a teacher or a parent, you probably are, are inclined to get into the, the lecture, um, you know, you should be doing this, this and that. But if you, if you stick with the restorative questions, the next question is, well, what are you thinking now? You know, and, and he goes, I don't know, it could have been worse. Um, and it's okay, right, so it could have been worse, but, but it could have been better. And I just asked the next question then, you know, what could you have done differently? And he goes, I could have asked for it back. And then Michael, at this point, he's listening to this. He goes, apology accepted. Um, so by involving the, the, you know, and it just the whole thing just took about a minute. Um, you know, and, and, and contrasting it where I come in with, with the answer and the solution, as opposed to giving them the time and the space, you know, they, they, they sorted it out themselves. And, and if you've got two kids or two people, two colleagues, and if they can resolve it themselves and they're happy, happy days. And I suppose every parent has had, who has young kids has had the situation whereby you look at what's happened and you go, what were you thinking? And it's like, mm. yeah, that's, yeah. And, 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 and that, that can trigger you then into, that's, yeah, then it's the, ah, you know, it's like, oh, you should be thinking and you should be doing this. And, you know, but, it, but the questions, you know, you know, by, by all means, look up the questions. If, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you haven't seen them already, the next question is, what are you thinking now? So just rolling with the questions, you know, you're, you're kind of letting them know, hmm, probably should be thinking something, something different at this stage. Um, so that the question, they really work, you know, very well in that situation. They work for you as well. They keep you calmer as, as the, the teacher or the parent, you know, because, you know, by asking questions, that gives you a chance to kind of breathe, center, um, and pause, and, and just hear what's coming up rather than jumping in feet first. What age can you really start asking these questions to students or kids? Like, you know, I know you mentioned a six-year-old, but like, well, how, you know, what, what age would it really cease to be effective? Like a two-year-old, three-year-olds or, you know. We, we, we talk to babies anyway, you know, so, so babies, you know, at the very youngest age, we're, we're, it's all, oh, you're so cute and cool. And, oh, you, you drop that. Um, I would, you know, like if, if you're, if you understand the questions and the rationale, I'm not saying you have to, ask a start of questions all day every day but why not just say oh i wonder what you were thinking there you know you can actually introduce this at a very young age um, as part of your your own just dialogue and, and vocabulary and it's not that you're expecting an answer back you know but they're hearing the questions over time and you can you know you can you can adapt the questions you know what were you feeling how did how did this make someone else feel so you you play with the questions but getting across those ideas um, from the very beginning you know, and you're asking them at two, three, four, five, it might be six before you get the first coherent answer back. But you've just dropped a number of, of pebbles over time. You've kind of worked them into your own mindset, which, which is a benefit. You're creating a culture as well. Um, you know, so over, over time, they, they will absorb this. Um, you know, I think a lot of time we, we think whatever it is, the program, you know, well, I just need to ask this question and that question and the other question. And I need to get the answer back pretty much today. Um, the start of practice isn't like that. It's, it's, it's more a way of being than, you know, asking certain questions. Uh, so you're creating a culture, you're dropping little ideas uh, over time, and then eventually it, it pays off. So, you know, on a good day, my own kids will work out something between themselves. Like they're, they're eight, 10 and 12 now, they will resolve their own conflicts on a good day. Um, and I'd like to think it's because they've gotten used to the idea of, 
okay, I need to tell my story. I need to listen to your story. Um, and then I need to suggest a solution and, and you need to just suggest a solution. Um, but it takes time to develop that culture. So I would say, start asking the questions in your own way, in your own style from the very beginning. And uh, obviously now that we sort of, you know, the, the, the data and the psychology, psychological theory has got was basically sort of proven that the care or talk at a young age becomes your self-talk as an adult. Then, you know, presumably even down the line as adults, their way of resolving things internally when they make a mistake or goof is different than... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, they're creating a, a theory of mind. I think is, is, the, yeah, is the, that's the word the that's coming to mind, yeah. uh, and they're you know they're used to you know without understanding all the words necessarily. They're used to okay, well if something goes wrong, mommy and daddy are just going to ask me a load of questions, and I hear this back for you know uh, oh god a load of questions. Okay, but I mean in another context, mommy and daddy are just going to be shouting, or, or yeah. got to be the, the teacher is going to be shouting. So they're they're absorbing this. Uh, they're absorbing so many messages. Um, and again, you know, make the questions your own, make the language your own. Um, it doesn't mean you have to sound like a, like a, sometimes you hear that as well, or just sound like a robot. No, you, you'll know the way to phrase it uh, yourself. One that's come straight to mind is that what if a child or a student, if it's in a school, just doesn't bother engaging or doesn't answer the question? I know it's, it's great that they, they might, or even, but even a, I don't know, is an answer. What if they just, yeah. I, I get that question every course I do. What if they don't? Um, and there's a couple of things in this, I suppose. One is there's a, maybe from, from the teacher, the adult point of view, there's a little bit of fear, anxiety. Okay, I, I've got this restorative practice now. I'm asking this, you know, Joe told me there should be a positive response and he or she uh, is not answering. They're not engaging, you know, oh God, what do I do? Um, I mean, what would we do anyway if we're trying to teach a kid <clears throat> to, to play hurling, <clears throat> to play basketball? You'd encourage, you know, you'd, encourage, you'd have a, a belief that they will get it. They will, um, yeah, in time get it, you know. So, <clears throat> so really, come on, you know, like, you're not just trying and, 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 and have a go at these questions. Um, you know, presumably as well, they, they, you know, you've told them at some point, like there's a poster on the wall that these are the questions we're asking. So, you know, you've done a little bit of, background preparation look these are the questions do you just want to maybe you know here here they are written down do you just want to write them down for now would you not just give it a go so it looks they're very hum, humanity which, which which we have anyway i'm not saying we don't but sometimes when when the restart of questions come along you know we, we get more focused on the the questions if you like the then then maybe you know the, the process so the first thing i'd say is just encourage you know look, would you not give it a go um you know Maybe, maybe I'll come back in, in a few minutes. Now, you know, I suppose, look, at the end of the day, if they really are dug in, you know, I mean, I, I've heard it, you know, that, that you can give um, some of the trainers that I, I trained under would say, give them the choice. So like, you know, you can, you can have option A is look, let's, let's answer the questions, let's work through them. You know, I'm pretty sure you can do it. Come on, you know, you did great last week. That's option A. Option B is, look, you, you, you broke whatever rule it is. You know, you know the story that that's a detention or a letter home or lines or whatever, whatever it is, is, you know, the, the, the recognized consequence. That's option B. So if they really are dug in, you know, you know, you need some accountability. So look, it's option A or option B. I really like this. And it, a student might say, no, I just take the detention. Oh, God. OK, right. Look, next time, let's let's do it the other. Let's, we might do it the other way. But OK, you want this. You've chosen it. Okay, you respect that. So there is, if you like, a you know a safety net. But I think to recognise that a lot of it is just you know that initial fear and apprehension, and maybe on both sides. So just to to, to name that and just you know encourage it. Um, but again, you know, like you probably do need that 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 safety net. So say two students resolve an issue, but uh, like the teachers or or the students' parents come back around and they say that you've been too soft or they're not happy with the outcome. Um, what would you say to that? Again, something that, that comes up, I'm thinking of one school in particular where the, the principal is extremely restorative. He, you know, he loves the, the, the questions, the process, the fairness. Um, but he regularly, he's, he'll say to me that some of his teachers are, 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 are if you like, on, on his case. And again, you know, you, as you mentioned, sometimes parents, someone from the outside is looking at, what do you mean he or she said that? And, and all it was was a conversation and a sorry. 
So the thing there is definitely this idea of, of before anything like that happens at the, at the beginning, you're explaining, you're explaining to teachers, you're explaining to students and you're explaining to parents. I mean, they're the three big stakeholders, if you like, in, in any school. Look, we, we, we've spoken about it, we've agreed, we, we are going to be a restorative school. This is how we're going to work. You know, we, we're not necessarily going to go down the, the, the route of, of punishment, etc. You know, when something happens, our, as, a, as a school, our ethos, our approach is to sit people down, find out the story, what happened, who was harmed. You know, we, we believe in, in, in acknowledging harm and, you know, holding people accountable and, and getting people to come up with, you know, some solution, some, some strategy. So that's explained to parents, and that, that might take a lot of explaining because parents, you know, yourself, you're probably the same generation as me, you know, we went to school and, you know, I can still remember getting slaps on, on, on the hand from a ruler, you know, and, and you know, so the old style, if you like, um, was punishment. So, so if, you're, if you're a parent and you're used to that, you know, you haven't been to school in 30 years, you're expecting, you know, that style of approach. So Your school only had rulers. Luxury, absolute luxury. What? We were a hurling school when I was going to school. That was a different oh, approach. Early. Okay, there was a meter stick as well. I remember the meter yeah. stick getting, getting broken yeah. up somewhere. Yeah, and, uh, and plus having to walk 60 miles in the snow, bare feet. With the, oh, yeah, yeah. All that stuff, yeah. 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 Arrow older than me. Um, <laughs> it, has, it, has definitely cha- it has definitely changed the approach yeah. Since, yeah, yeah. since we were going. So, in. so, so the teachers are probably much, you know, you know they're, they're much more in tune. The students are probably much more in tune. So there's, there's a, but there's a piece of work then to be done with, with parents, you know, uh, and educating parents because it's, otherwise it's not fair. It's not fair that, you know, they don't know about this thing. So, I mean, just to, to, to touch on fair process, um, which is another cornerstone of restorative practice, the three E's, engage, just let everybody know the way you're working, explanation, why, why we're doing this, and expectation clarity. So to the parents, you know, so if they do hear, Johnny and Mary have had an argument, you know, they've, they've sat down, it's been resolved, you know, someone has apologized to someone else. Um, that that's, you know, the parents could reasonably expect that type of an outcome. Um, so there's the so fair process is a huge part. And just, again, educating people in advance rather than setting themselves up for some sort of surprise or shock uh, down the road. Most schools also have a code of conduct or behavior. So how do you balance the rules with the idea that restorative conversations and dialogue can sort out issues? So for example, if there's a clash between the two methods, aren't the rules the rules? So if somebody does something that according to the book, you have to send a note home to the parents, for example, but in the meantime, the teacher and the two parties have all sorted it out restoratively, do you then let it get sorted out restoratively and send a note or do you stop a note and then be in, pulled up because you haven't followed the rules like where does the balance lie yeah so again something that comes up quite regularly you know as you say the, the code of behavior code of conduct says this now we're working restoratively so you might get uh, an apology of some de- some description uh, which then i mean you, you know you don't want to be you know kids to have a lovely you know, conversation and, and resolution and an apology, you know, it, it's, it's going to be double punishment then if, if you also do, you know, whatever the code of behaviours uh, dictates. So I suppose the thing here is, you know, what I'd say to schools are teachers, you know, quickly they're going to, they're going to identify this. The code of behaviour is going to have to be reviewed in light of a new approach. I mean, you review, if you're, if you're changing approach, you know, you want to say what you do and do what you say. So, so the code of behaviour is going to have to be reviewed if you want to be a fully restorative school, to, just to reflect that. Now, I wouldn't suggest that they do it, it has to be done day one, you know, but I mean, you want, maybe we just want to identify a few people to start looking into that. And just somewhere in the code of behavior, it says something along the lines of, look, we're a restorative school, we're going to have, you know, our first instinct is going to be a restorative approach. Um, you know, and if that doesn't work, you know, maybe there, there, there's, a, there's alternative um, consequences if you like. Uh, and the thing as well about, about all of this is, you know, you know, you might have rules, but, you know, kids, there's a lot of gray area, you know, and, and different situations will arise. So, I mean, you know, like there's a big difference between a kid having a really, if you're like, good kid, never, never steps out of line, and you're just having a really bad day, you know, something's been happening, 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 you don't like, you mightn't see it, and then he, he, he lashes out either verbally or physically, um, we'll just say verbally, you know, um, 
you know, and, and then do you do you come down with the, the full weight of the, of, of the code of behavior in that situation? Or, or you know, do you take account of, of what happened if and when you find out? Or then you have the kid who's just maybe the, the frequent flyer is just having those issues all day, every day. You know, like kids know as well, they go like, geez, Johnny, Mary, like they were just having a really bad day. So if you can have a start of conversation and acknowledge that and facilitate some, 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 some dialogue, you know, I, th I think most kids would say, right, that's reasonable. Uh, and that uh, maybe the, what's, what's mandated in the, in the code of behavior would be a step too far. So I think it's our, our fear that can I, can I deviate a little bit? But yeah, there's a fear again, as, as the adult of, of maybe being judged. Um, but if you're, if you, if you get that ethos, that explanation, right, people will understand, right? Look, it's not, not, in, not every situation is black and white and, as a first port of call, if we can try and resolve situations, um, yeah, I think that people would say that that's fair or that that's reasonable. Um, but yeah, so to answer the question, the code of behavior is going to have to be reviewed at, at some point to, to, to reflect the new the new approach. Um, and just maybe to, just the follow on question with that is that because your code of behavior is the and like whatever your rules are, is any, whether you're a school, a company, a group, a nonprofit, whatever your rules that you set up and agree for yourselves is what you're held to if there's an issue and has to go to arbitration, like a lawyer or whatever those things. So um, not all codes of behavior would have discretion for teachers, rather from historical reasons or whatever. So would it be something that, you know, if a school is looking at the journey before they change the code of behavior, should they, you know, acknowledge or at least mention somewhere along the line that you're starting a restorative practice journey and that you're going to be trying to implement some of these so that it's at least written down. So if you have the situation, you have a parent not happy with something <laughs> that you've, you've covered yourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, so taking the point that, yeah, you don't, you probably don't want a big interval between starting to work restoratively and, and, and the code of behavior um, reflect, not reflecting that. So yeah, so you know, probably a good suggestion to have introduced some line in that and say, if you're starting a restorative journey, um, going to be trying some some new things and then you know at the same time then start the, the longer term um change you know changes that that, that need to happen uh, and the other thing is that when, when we when we really define rules and behaviors really narrowly you know you, you, yeah you're going to have to kind of be accountable to that so to, to, i mean the good thing if you like about restorative approach is that you know you, you're you're leaving a little bit of space you know you're allowing for for the gray and and, and allowing for the fact that in, in any situation you know, the resolution might be, you know, the two people are going to have, you know, they'll come up with, with their own solution. So it might be that they're going to have lunch together every day or in another situ situation, you know, they're going to just maybe nod to each other from a distance or, you know, the solutions are going to be, depending on, on the individuals and the circumstances, are going to be quite different. So the, the tighter we define rules and consequences, you know, it's actually, we think it's, it's, it's something that's good and beneficial but ultimately then we have to hold it to, to, to that. So sometimes it's better to, to leave it a little bit looser at, at the start, if you like, um, while still holding to the, you know, the principle that something will be done. You know, there will be a review, there will be a conversation, there will be something. Uh, and that if, you know, trusting that, you know, if, if pupils and teachers and a principal or parents get together, you know, they will make the appropriate decision. Um, so there's, there's a bit of trust involved, uh, allowing that, gray area if you like um but i suppose the point being sometimes if, if we narrow box things off too tightly as much as we think it's going to help us it can actually hurt us in, in the long run because yeah every situation is going to be different most primary school teachers are probably comfortable with the idea of circles or circle time um but i'm guessing a lot of secondary school teachers for example would think that circles wouldn't work for them um you know or be not really appropriate is that the case yeah, so, so again, you know, like circle time is, is definitely, it's nearly built into the, the, the primary school model, getting kids in circle, uh, working that way, you know, and, and then I suppose we think that, oh, this is just childish babies or just something for primary schools. But I mean, there, there's, there's many examples. Um, Michelle Stowe, I have to mention Michelle Stowe, she's got a, a video um, easily to, if you look, if you type in Michelle Stowe and circle time, you'll see a, a brilliant a secondary school example of, of a circle in action and um, problem solving circle and, and there's many secondary school teachers who, who use this on a regular basis it might look a bit different you know it might be just a quicker standing circle 
you know, just asking that 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 engaging question at, at the start, just for a minute or two. Um, sometimes it's you know, depending on, on the layout. I mean, the, the architecture of a classroom then can can mitigate against it. If you, if you're in a science lab or it's benches, or, or you know, you can't move tables around, you might just get kids sitting on, on, on tables. So that they call it a, a squircle rather than, than a circle, a square circle. Um, but it can be used. It can be used very quickly. It can be used for teaching uh, as well as that that kind of engaging piece. But ultimately, I mean, I suppose it comes back to why. Why would you do the circle at all? If you don't understand the why, you know, you're just going to look at it and uh, what's in it for me. But if you understand that by, by fostering a, a greater sense of belonging, of community, uh, of, of, of safety, psychological safety, your kids are going to feel, your students are going to feel more part of the class, safer. Uh, and, and that little bit of fun, if you like, as well, you know, we're, we're 31 percent smarter. When we're in a positive mood so i mean I, i've had teachers i've introduced circles maybe on, on the first or second night of a course they come back the next week they said that they had you know pineapple on pizza yes or no rips around the class in, in 90 seconds <clears throat> and they've, they've worked so much better it's just lifted the mood and um, 31 percent smarter for, for for two minutes effort so you got to understand the why as well because otherwise you know, you're, you're not going to, if you, don't, if you don't understand it, you're just not going to do it. Yeah, I suppose for secondary school kids, if they're going into the corporate world at some stage in the future, they'll get very reacquainted with circle time because they call them huddles or morning briefings, but it's essentially circle time, yeah, get everybody on the same page. If you, if you go to any any ongoing training, you know, whatever it is, <clears throat> generally the, the, you sit in a circle, someone will stand up beside a flip chart at the start of the day, expectations for the day or, you know, group agreement, whatever it is. Um, so we do it at primary school, we do it in the adult world, but for some reason there's, there's, a, there's I suppose it's a, a fear, maybe anxiety. Are they going to think this is you know, babyish? Um, but if you as, as the teacher, as the leader, as the adult, have enough understanding, um, enough skill, you know, you wanna, you know, you, it's a skillful thing to do like anything, but if you're competent and then you've got the confidence to, to, you know, to, to, to do it, to drive it, um, yeah, you will overcome those initial giggles or whatever it is very, very quickly. And I mean, I've, I've role model circles for, for in secondary schools myself and, you know, they, they, they love it. They love it. You know, it, it's just a little bit of confidence and, and persistence um, to get over any would-be misconceptions or hang-ups. Can circles be used for teaching or is it all just for fun? Um, both, both. Um, I suppose not to underestimate the just for fun you know I, I, um i hope she doesn't kill me but my manager in a previous uh, my previous job um she could she, she she struggled to get past this this fun circle this, this check-in in the morning you know we set the, the four of us might sit down fun question go around and, and it took her a long time to understand that it wasn't just for fun i mean what were you doing you were you were elevating the mood of everyone, you know, and people would say it straight away. You could see it. So for, for two minutes effort, you had people who were feeling a, bit, a little bit better, a little bit more lively, better focused, um, slightly, you know, better connections with each other. So, I mean, right. So, I mean, one example that always comes to mind was, you know, two of us happened to have, have laid a patio that weekend. You know, there's, a, there's a conversation later in the day about his patio and my patio. So that just for fun had done a huge amount in, in, in a very short space of time. Um, so, the, so the question is, can it, is it, is it, can it be done for teaching as well? Absolutely. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not a teacher, but I mean, I, I've, you know, I, I've read, I've heard, I've seen, um, I've, I've demonstrated a small bit of how you can do teaching. Um, you know, for example, you're, you're, and maybe teachers probably do this already, but getting everyone in, in a circle and just having a kind of a, a battle, a max battle. So, so five plus seven, you know, pointing at two kids, uh, and the excitement it generates. So you're having a maths quiz, if you like, but you're just, you're doing it in a circle. Everybody's, everybody's engaged, everybody's tuned in. And, and then you get the last two to have, you know, so, so, and everybody's listening. So, so even though you're asking, you know, five plus seven here, um, everybody else is listening and doing it in their head, but it just creates such engagement. Um, I suppose, look, I have to give a recommendation here. Um, Adam Voigt, he's, he's the head of Real Schools Australia. He's done a one hour webinar if you just type in Adam Voigt Circles webinar, you'll find it pretty quick. He's given a one-hour webinar, which I think is a masterclass in how to, to teach using circles. And, and he's, he's not a fan of the, 
the extended go around, by the way, if that's your, your worry, we're going to have to listen to everyone talk for, for a minute. It's turn and talk. So just working in pairs. Uh, and again, people, 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 I'm sure teachers do this, but they might recognize it as restorative practice or, you know, or, or circle time necessarily. But getting kids to just turn to your neighbor and talk about what do you know about the Vikings? What do you know about the mountains of, of Munster or, or, or wherever? Um, and, and just just for 90 seconds and then come back to the group asking another question. So definitely teachers can use circles for teaching. Um, it'll drive up engagement. It'll, it'll drive up, you know, it'll just be a better atmosphere. And I, and I know teachers who basically just teach in circle, act and teach and work in circles all day, every day. Um, again, just comes back to, I suppose, understanding the why and, and having that, that, that skill and, and support at the beginning because it, it is a leap, you know, I recognize to, to, to go from your way of teaching, any change is a leap. So you, you want to you wanna be supported in that. You want to see it. You want to be supported in it. You want to have someone maybe watch you doing it to, to feedback. Um, so to, yeah, I'm not minimizing the change, but just to say it can be done. It has been done and it is being done. You also mentioned trauma awareness a lot uh, in your talks and your videos. Um, is it not just enough to learn about restorative practice? No, I, I don't think so. And, it's, and this is new to me, um, I suppose, to be fair, only because I initially, initially I did my training, I become a trainer. It was, if you like, the traditional restorative practice um, model. Um, but in, only in the, I, know, I was always aware of trauma, but in the last couple of years, I'm, I'm really beginning to see that you need that additional lens. You know, I know it might sound, oh my God, I had to learn restorative practice and trauma. Trauma is not complicated, you know. You know, it's, it, at the end of the day, it's not complicated. Just understanding that things have happened to people and they have or have or potentially have an impact on them. And, and, and the biggest thing, just to say this, the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway that I, I'd just like to get across here is just regulating yourself, okay? So when, when trauma happens to, to kids, we're talking about, about kids in school here, when trauma happens to kids, they struggle to regulate themselves, okay? Um, and, you know, Teachers know what that means you know, in, in a hundred different ways. And what that happens then is that can trigger us. So all of a sudden we're struggling to regulate ourselves. Uh, and then you're into, a, you know, you've got two, a, a teacher and a, and a pupil who are maybe up here. If we regulate ourselves, if we only regulate ourselves, if we only take a breath or three breaths and, you know, center ourselves and, and bring ourselves down, if we only do that, you will bring a student down. If you, but if you're up here and they're doing something and you're asking, well, why did you do that? And why did you do this? And if you're dysregulated, you will never get them down. If, if you only regulate yourself, you will bring them down a little bit and then add in something like that, that first question, what's happened? As opposed to why, you know, as opposed to those two things, center and regulate yourself will, will, will bring your, your student down a little bit. And then asking that first question, what happened as opposed to why? And that will get their if you like, prefrontal cortex engaged as well. You know, you might, you might need to take five minutes before you do this, but those two things, and that's trauma awareness. You know, it's trauma awareness is not some weird mystical thing. It's it, center yourself and start asking what happened as opposed to why. There's more to it, but I think even just getting that across is, is so crucial. A big complaint people have had with new trainings or new programs is that you know, we don't have the time. So um, what would you say to people who are thinking of implementing a sort of practice that think it takes too long? Yeah, when I, when, I suppose when, when I hear we, we don't have the time, I, um, what I, what I, what I, when someone says that, what I'm hearing is we're not getting the support. Um, and I would agree, you know, like I've done it. I, I worked 18 years in residential childcare centers, been on many great courses, don't get me wrong, great course, really interesting, either a couple of hours or, or a day or a couple of days. Um, and that's it. You're, you're sent back to, to, to the, the team and maybe sometimes then your manager asks you to just, yeah, so you've got this, just let the, your team know in about five minutes what all that was and hey, we're, we're going to take it on. Nothing will, will work like that. It can't work like that. So back to the start of practice, you know, to, to get into the mindset, to get into the, 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 the tools, to get some practice, all this will take time, but it'll take support. I suppose that's the point. I'd like to change time almost into support. So teachers will need to be 
you know, facilitate it to, 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 to learn, to discuss. So as part of, of, of staff meetings, whatever it, whatever it looks like, the school we will know what, what it is. You just need, need that support to, to, to practice, to make mistakes, to learn from it, to reflect. And then, I think I said it before, when you get that at the start or over time, all of a sudden you realize, yeah, this, this is actually, it can be quite quick. You know, I can just change what I'm saying in a couple of seconds and, you know, I, I, can, I can do a circle for here for a couple of minutes and, and you'll save, you'll save so much time. But, it, but it's the support at the start. I think that's when we feel pressured and we feel anxious, we're, we're not, we're not thinking, so we're not regulated ourselves. So to, but if we, if we, we know, okay, that we're going to have a follow-up session or a workshop or whatever it is, that will, that will center us uh, and then we're in a better place to learn. Um, another big complaint that we might hear for ORP is that you need everyone to sing off the same hymn sheet for it to work. Yeah. So um, how, would you, how would you answer that one? Yeah, again, you know, and, and I can understand all this because, you know, at the start, you're, you're asking a lot. You're asking people to, to change, to unlearn some practices and then relearn something different. Or to maybe to consider that you know you maybe what what you've been doing for five ten twenty years hasn't been the best way of working and 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 you know I just want to say like I've made every mistake under the sun uh, so it's not about blaming we we do the best we can at that time with the skills we have so that goes for our students and ourselves so it's not about um, you know, beating ourselves up or, or me beating a, a school up for what you did so when when you know so when we're, we're trying to learn. Um, you know, bringing these new changes, you know, maybe sometimes we're, we're you know, we, we look for, I don't want to say excuses or reasons not to do it. Um, you know, we need everyone doing it. Um, you know, it's no good unless everyone does it. You know, I, I just hear that as oh, I'm worried to make this change. What I would say is start small. May, you know, you, you probably, if, if, if you've done a little bit of research or gone on a course, you probably, you're probably interested. So, and it is, I say, there is a bit of work to do. There's a journey to go, but just take that first step. You know, just, just whatever it is for you, you know, you, you probably want to consider the needs of students. You probably want to, to change how you do it. Start small and, and, and be that restorative oasis, if you like. You know, if, if the rest of the school have that traditional approach, you start in your own level of comfort, your own, how far you want to go, you start doing it for yourself, okay, in your class, and just see how you get on. My guess is if you start making some changes, start bringing fair process, bring in fair process, bring in a couple of circles, bring in um, a different way of, of asking, bring in the questions. My guess is if you start that, um, you will see some, some differences, you will see some benefits, and then other teachers will start getting curious. And yeah, just let them know what you're doing. Let them know what you're doing. Um, and it can build from there, and it has built from there. I heard of one school where it was, it was, just, it was just one special needs assistant. Uh, it was an English school. I remember we hearing a podcast. It was one special needs assistant. She was the one who started it, and I don't know exactly how many years, five, six years later, the whole school was restarted. So sometimes it's, it's an act of bravery or courage to, 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 to be the, 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 the trendsetter, Um but start small, start small, and, and you can, you know, you can, you, you can be that restorative oasis. And then um, on the flip side, if there's a school that's interested in like whole school implementation, um, how would you say they should approach it? Oh, so there's, yeah, there's, there's a few ways to go about it. Um, I mean, again, you know, you, so you, you do want people getting some training at the start because... <clears throat> That, that is reassuring. It gives people an understanding of, if you like, the, you know, the, the landscape of what's involved. And you know, you're, you're not an expert overnight, but you have an idea of, okay, well, there's, there's these four or five areas to restart a practice. So what, what I'd suggest is getting four or five, six people maybe that are interested. Um, actually, I'll just backtrack a small bit. You know, get, get, a, get a, a one or two hour pro park um, session. So that, that one or, or two hour overview to everybody okay so that'll, that'll be very it'll just touch on, on the overall principles but you'll get everyone some way informed of, of what this is or, or isn't okay and then you know get five or six people get a, an implementation team uh, joe brummer ha, has has written very extensively on this just to, to, to drop his name he's an american 
uh, trauma-informed RP trainer. Um, he recommends, and I, and I would I would agree, getting five or six people as an implementation team trained up. So, so all of a sudden they have, again, some initial training, understanding, and then as a school, they can decide what, what it'll look like. Okay, so it's gonna take time. You don't wanna rush everything, but as a school, they can, that, that implementation team can liaise with other colleagues, can liaise with board of management, uh, parents association, students, parents, you know, the, the wider the, the wider environment and, and come up with their own plan. And it needs to be their own plan. You know, that's the other point. Restorative practice is about working with, it's not about someone like me coming and, and doing it to people or for people, because then what happens when I'm gone or, you know, people get the feeling that, this is being imposed on us. So the ethos is very much work with, and if you have a small team, you know, with, with a range of skill sets. So you, you've got, it's not just everyone passionate about RP, you know, you need practical people. You need people who can plan, who are you know, good at the detail. And they'll hold you to account. Um, and, and you need maybe someone who's a bit, you know, I don't know about this, you know, maybe someone who'll just really hold you to account and, and question it. Um, you know, so, so, so a range of skills is, is definitely a good way to go. And um, if there is a school who's sort of done those steps, like they had a, like a, a couple of Croke Park hours, an overview, then they put together a small team of people with you know, the appropriate skills to do a bit of further training, who are then going to try and help tailor it for exactly their school's needs. In terms of supports, are they then left some, see ya, off you go, best of luck, or can they access, you know, like monthly check-ins or coaching their stuff afterwards to help along because we're the best one in the world and our own practice have done similar stuff in other areas for healthcare settings um, without sometimes we have to three, four years of having somebody there to keep them on track. It's like you get the plate spinning, but unless they have a little bit of help sometimes and the plate starts wobbling, it just falls off the best will in the world. Um, do you, is that available or is that something the school has to go looking for? Or how would it work? There's, there's so much available. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the word is support. I mean, absolutely, it comes down to support because at the start, if it's just one or two or five or six, that's a tough place to be trying to get this up and running, you know, and, and there's mistakes happening, you know, and the temptation when mistakes happen is, Let's just go back to the way we always did it, you know, that, that safe, even if it wasn't the best way in the world, at least everybody understood it. So it, it definitely needs, needs support to start. And, and there's so much. So even, I mean, down to, you know, contacting yourself or myself, um, you know, we are starting a community practice in September uh, this year. So a monthly set up there where, you know, teachers can come along and just discuss issues. Um, if you are at trainer level, CDI have a trainer's um, community practice as well. You know, that, 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 that will take a while to get up there. Um, but, I, but I think as well, just within the, own, within the school themselves, a community of practice, you know, people can, can be their own support as well. So, I mean, certainly you have someone, someone like myself is available as, you know, to, to, to support and guide. CDI have their own um, people as well that will help you. But just not to, not to underestimate a school's own community practice, you know, and, and just sitting there, what's working, what's not working. Um, and if, if you've got seven or eight or, or 10 people there together, someone will know, you know, every, to, collectively we will know, okay, there's this um, training available. Um, there's the, these videos, there's these books, you know, I've read this book. So people, can, I suppose it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dual thing, supporting themselves and then knowing where to go. So someone, I say, like myself, like, like CDI, um, there's so much out there so yeah and um this is just something that just occurred to me um based on the department of ed stats um on schools over half just or sorry, just under half the schools in the country um have over 200 pupils so about 55 percent or thereabouts have under 100 pupils and a small number of teachers so i know you're mentioning about sort of you know like you have five or six people to try and lead it etc but if you're at school with like four teachers is you know, is the same sort of support available there or is it a case that, you know, they should try and band together or can they just pick up the phone and call someone like yourselves and get help? Like, it, basically, what I'm trying to work out is, you know, is this only for big schools or can a small school get the same level of help? It's definitely for, for, for any size school. I mean, I know one of the, one of the initiatives I was trying to, to get up and running before COVID, COVID obviously put a, a big a stop on a lot of what I was doing there a couple of years ago, is like that, I mean, to get three schools, three, four schools together. So if you're a principal and you're interested, 
Um, what I would say is, you know, maybe talk to, you know, you'll know other principals in the area, talk to principals, you know, is this something you'd like to, to join up with? Um, you know, so maybe getting three, four schools together, you know, getting either, if, it, if it's a four school, uh, four teacher school, get all your teachers. If it's a, if it's a 10 teacher school, get, get five from, from your school, five from another school, five from another school, you know, contact someone like me or, or one of the other trainers that are out there and, and get going that way. Uh, and was, uh, we did it. To, we did it to a small extent in, in Limerick. And you know, teachers. You know, there was one occasion we did it. We had three schools together, and teachers really enjoyed it. I have to say, the idea that you know, and we we alternated the the three nights between three schools, and just to get those 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 links and hear different perspectives, just to step into someone else's school and hear, oh my God, it's the same stuff going on here. And um, there was a lot of of, um, of support of, of interest in, in that style of a method um, but the thing is and, and you know I suppose COVID definitely was, was a big lock in, in everything but we'll, we'll, we'll get back there is afterwards when it's if you like the after initial training it's about getting in those supports that community of practice so look you know every month or every second month we're going to come together you know, we're going to look at what's going on and just yeah, just keeping it alive in many different ways so it takes a lot of different inputs so something you know, something like something small like just getting a little note in the um the parents association newsletter and uh, this is what's happening you know if you're interested you know feel free to to, to ring whoever the, the contact person is getting a few posters up um there's lots of li li little ways of, of keeping it going um so community practice um, and and yeah I, I actually love the idea of, of different schools coming together to kind of support each other and, and work that way. I suppose one of the um, uh, unnecessary sort of side effects of the whole COVID situation as well is that we have sort of skipped about 10 years in terms of technology adaptation uh, worldwide. So, you know, you don't have to be down the road anymore. You can sort of link Donegal, <laughs> Kerry, Dundalk. You could each have a school and those doing this. Yeah. As long as you're at the same yeah. stage of the journey, I presume, would that be right? Yeah, um, funny you mentioned Donegal. I've, I've done a couple of web. I'm in, I'm in Limerick, and I've done um, a webinar with, with Donegal, and I'll be giving a course there in, in the autumn. Um, one of the webinars, you know, there was 200 teachers um, from around the country. So, so again, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're at a school in Donegal, do it remotely. You know, team up with a, with a school from Cork and a school for, from Galway, or a school from Limerick. Um, and, and people are finding that remotely okay it's it's it's, it's not as good as face to face but it, but you're not you're not comparing if you like like with like you're comparing either we can do this remotely with, with other like minded schools or yeah we're just going to we, we can't do it at all so in that situation it's been such a blessing and, and an addition um, can a school take restorative practice as a an a la carte approach like a like a menu just take the little bits they want and ignore the rest um can they? Probably they can. Um, should they? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I mean, again, I suppose I've made the point already. Taking on restorative practice at the start, it sounds, it is, a, I suppose, a, a big thing. You know, it, it sounds like a big thing and people are going to be kind of, you know, anxious, you know, you know about all this because you've got so many other things that you're, you're trying to do in a school. And you, at the same time, you're hearing about restorative practice, you're probably hearing about a dozen, the principal's probably hearing about another dozen very, presumably very, very good programs. So I can understand why a school might say, oh, right, we'll just do the questions, if you like. So, so can you just do the, the questions, for example? I mean, you, you, you can. Is it going to be the best way to, in long term to, to, to become a restorative school, if, that, if that's your aim, and presumably it is? You know, like anything, if you're in, you're, why not go all in, if you like? And that... And again, that doesn't mean all in on day one, year one, and get everything down, you know, by, by the end of, of the year. So, so just recognize that, I mean, it's, maybe it's a cliche, that, that, but it's a journey and it is a valid, it's a valid cliche. You know, it, it, it is a journey. I mean, you can start with, again, just back to the questions, but you want to be making sure that in a, in a few weeks or a few months time, you come back to the circle, the benefit of circles and how the two can interact and help each other. And then, you know, maybe another six months down the line, you know, it, it's down to the start of language. So again, if, if you want to get the full benefit, why not go all in? That's what I'd say. Is the start of practice something that a teacher should teach directly to students to allow them to use in the future? 
Um, yeah, again, well, why not? Um, so again, so at the start, again, you want to be kind of developing your own understanding, your own competence, comfort levels, and uh, you know, just just getting a feel for it yourself. But then, you know, if it's working for you, if you understand it, if you're if you're comfortable with it, yeah, just start letting kids know. Look, you know, why don't you do what I'm doing? You know, you know. So there's so two kids are coming to you with with, with a dispute. How about you give it a go? Um, if, if you've got the time, you know, of, of course, why not have a go yourselves and, and just see how they get on? And if, if they need support, you're going to give them that support. Um, but, the, you know, the, the benefits are, are there. If you're seeing the benefits, why not, if you, if you like, pass it on to, to someone else and and be overt about what you're doing? Look, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the story. I'm trying to get what happened and I'm trying to get a resolution. Um, and, and just by asking the questions, you will be, you know, presumably modeling and teaching indirectly, but by all means, you know, talk about it with them. Um, you know, have you had circles then are a great way of, of helping them to reflect on what's happening. So maybe you decide to, to consciously teach this and, and promote it. Um, so what are the type of examples where you could you do this with someone else? Uh, what might it look like? Um, you know, who's going to give it a go and then come back the next week? You know, did anyone try it? Did anyone give it a go? Did anyone, how did you get on? What went wrong? What went well? What went wrong? Um, but definitely share it. I mean, it works. It works for me. Share it with, with your kids. And, and over time, depending on the age and stage of development, teach them the skills. If you're like, a, a, obviously like a teacher, SNA, but you know, you've covered a lot of that with what, what schools should do, but say you're a youth club leader or you're in charge of a local sports club, um, you know, uh, or anybody is in charge of a group of people, you know, um, and you're watching this and you think it would work in your setting. Like, what's the very next step you should take from right now? The very next step, um, to be honest, I'd say just just send send me an email, you know, because there's, I mean, there there are, you know, there are courses for youth workers, there are courses for teachers, there are you know many people that are that are interested, uh, and then then there's many many resources, uh, both both nationally and internationally. I'd say the very next step is just send send me an email uh, if you're interested, you know, and I can you can talk about what exactly you're looking for, what 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 exactly might help, um, and I'm yeah, I definitely love to see start a practice. I, I, I mean, it's great it's in schools, you know, but I, I I would love to see it branching out so that you know parents have resources and, and tools and maybe a community and that sports clubs. I think sports clubs could definitely benefit um, from you know, taking the, the best of a starter practice and, and, and weaving it into how, how they do business, um, scout, group, scout groups, you name it. Um, but it, it, does, it probably does te- need a bit of teasing out. So I'd say just, just send, send me an email. And um, this is a, basically just an idea to understand how far does restorative practice actually go? So for example, if you've got two kids, say John and Jim, and John breaks Jim's toy, uh, and then it says, sorry, you know, that's well, we're all very st- restorative. I've asked all the questions, they've gone through it. And, you know, John is very, very sorry for breaking Jim's toy. But at the end of the day, Jim's got no toy left. And Jim's parents, go, when they go home, it goes, I've just spent 50 euro last weekend in Spitz on his toy. It's broken. He said, sorry, the school would rather resolve what story. Like at some stage, is, is that it? Or is there something more beyond it from there? I mean, I mean, sorry is not going to replace the, a toy really at the end of the day. So... You know, so if you're, if you're dealing with, with John and Jim, uh, I forget who, who's to- who broke whose toy, but, you know. Me too, I just forgot. <laughs> if it's Jim that that's toy is broken and you're asking him, you know, what is it you need? You know, the first thing isn't going to be, I need a sorry, I need an apology. The first thing is, you know, I, I need a, a toy. I need, a, you know, something replaced. So if, if you're really thinking and acting restoratively and, and finding out what people need, that, that's such a huge question. What is it you need? Because um, maybe another kid has... 50 of those trucks at home, you know, I, maybe they didn't like it. You know, I just need, I, I need him to say sorry. Um, so that, that, that could be, that could be the, the solution. And if it is fine, but if another kid and, and more than likely any kid is going to say, look, I, my toy's broke. I need a, a replacement. You know, then you're, you're over to, you know, the other kid and, and what can you do now? Look, you're going to have to use your own judgment can can they can they afford it? Um, is it going to is it going to be a question of two euros a week? Is it going to be you know bringing in mom and dad and, and they pay for it? So you know you're, you're going to have to look at what that actually means. 
Um, but yeah, it, you know, sorry, if a kid wants a new toy, sorry isn't going to pay for it. And if the harm, you know, that, that idea of harm as well, if, if the harm threshold is beyond a certain point, you know, the, the, the response, the accountability, the, the solution has to match it. You know, you know it can't, I mean, that's probably common sense, but sometimes when we, when we get into new, new ideas and new strategies, and we're thinking, oh, this restorative just means they have to say sorry. No, it doesn't. You know, um, my own daughter, she probably killed me for, for this story, but she had a bet with me um, only yesterday that, um, and it was around something, it doesn't matter what it was around, but we were going to get McDonald's and the bet was who would buy the McDonald's, me or her? And she's 12 and she lost the bet. <laughs> um, but I mean, I suppose what, what it came down to then was, you know, sorry, I wasn't going to hold her to, to, to buying McDonald's, you know, whatever it was, but it was like, okay, right, you really can't do that or you, you know, you know, well, what can you do? Okay, so we kind of neg negotiated. You know, there's few jobs needed doing around the house, and she agreed to, to doing it. But you know, you weren't, you're not, it's not about letting people off the hook. It's not about no consequences. It's not about no accountability. You, you want to have an appropriate response that's agreed. Well, you know, that, that certainly the person who's been harmed is, is comfortable with. Um, Which probably be different to the um, usual um, sort of like school approach in that. You know, that's just for John has an hour of detention for breaking Jim's toy. Jim's still left with no toy, but exactly. John's done his punishment and yeah. therefore is on is closed. Exactly. Yeah, and, and again, the, 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 I suppose the the unique um, aspect of most arguments, if you like, or, or disputes or conflicts. You know, if if John has fifty trucks at home, maybe he doesn't care about about a new toy. Maybe he, for him, it's the way that you know. The other kid acted, and yeah, maybe for him, it's about an apology. And and you know, look. So 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 again, unless you take the time to to listen to both sides and hear the needs, especially of the needs of the person who's been harmed, if you just come in with a with a, a school or parent mandated response, it's it's likely or possible possible that you won't meet anyone's needs, and and they'll both be upset. Whereas if you if you're able to stand back and let them as much as you can, as much as you know, a kid, kids can resolve their own conflict. You know, a lot of the times they they will do it themselves. Have you any final tips or thoughts for somebody starting their sort of practice journey? Um, I suppose I, th I think the, 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 some some form of, of, of basic training, one day introduction, is is always a good way to start because otherwise you're not sure. Am I getting everything? Am, am I seeing the, the full picture? So a one day introduction. Not that it'll make you an expert, you know, I'm, I'm five years at it and I, I don't consider myself an expert, uh, but a one day introduction will give you a good foundation and a good base then to, to start exploring. Um, I mean, if I, if I just recommend two books, I could recommend many, many books, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, so so nonviolent communication has been absorbed into most the start of practice training at this stage, even though it's a technique, strictly speaking, it's a separate uh, psychology, but even Marshall Rosenberg came to the idea of restorative justice towards the end of his own career. So they 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 do sync to so nonviolent communication. Uh, Marshall Rosenberg and the other book I mentioned him already, Joe Brummer, Trauma Informed Restorative Practice. Um, so one day course, reading some book, our podcast. You know, there's there's so many podcasts. If podcasts are your thing, go with what what you know. Sorry, just take a sip of water. Our, our YouTube videos, okay? So there's many, many YouTube video, videos as well. And there's also there's also an online course um, delivered by a guy called uh, Power, I think his name is, uh, who's uh, oh, a yeah, good couple of hours. Blow my own trumpet. So obviously, yeah, okay. Okay. click on the link after this. Yeah. Video course as well. Uh, just, be, just being modest there, Joe. Thanks thanks for bringing it up. Uh, and, and, and support, okay? It, it all comes back to support as well. So you, if you're on your own, you, you'll... My guess is you'll go so far and then you'll, you'll just drop it, okay? But if you, if, if, and support doesn't have to be another teacher, it doesn't have to be uh, a trainer. Support can be just telling your friend about this, okay? So when, 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 we, when, we, when we read something, when we hear about something, we have an understanding. But when we explain this to someone else, it forces us to a deeper level of understanding. So if I'm only, not, not, to, not to minimize any of my friends, but if I'm explaining this to one of my friends, that forces me to a deeper level of understanding all of a sudden there's a bit of support going on there. So you absolutely need support 
Um, I, you know, I suppose better again if you're in a, a community practice or you have, you know, some someone who who knows it. But don't be on your own. Start small and and enjoy it as well. Just play around with it. I mean, this is, I say, a way of being. Um, it's a lifelong journey. You know, and ho- you hopefully pretty sure you'll start to see the benefits, you know, small benefits in time and just enjoy it, you know, because I've, I've, I've loved every minute of my own journey. Um, and so if anybody needs to find anything more about restorative practice or is interested in it or learning more, you can find the uh, course that Joe had written and presented on the catscourse.com or you can send Joe an email at his email right here. Uh, wrong way, that way. And... Um, yeah, just reach out and um, he'll be able to help you out as you need it. And thank you very much for your time.